tonight on UCSD Conversations. Computer science students get a taste of what it takes to design computer games for the internet. Go behind the scenes with the police chief to see how to keep a university campus safe. And learn about a program that introduces high school students to careers in health. But first, Professors Jorge Mariscal and Jorge Huerta discuss the new Chicano Latino Arts and Humanities program at UCSD. Welcome to UCSD Conversations. I'm Jorge Huerta, Chancellor's Associate's Professor of Theater, and my guest today and fellow conversant is Professor Jorge Mariscal, the newly appointed director of the newly confirmed minor in Latina, Latino, Chicana, Chicano Studies, Arts and Humanities. So. It's going to be a conversation, therefore feel free to ask me questions, but I'll start with the first question, uh, Jorge, and that is, why a minor in Latina, Latino, Chicana, Chicano Studies minor? What is the evolution of this thought? Well, let me say first, Jorge, it's great to be with you here today. Um, many of the events that we'll be talking about, you, you were there back when Chicano Studies started. So um, our program now is based on the fact that demographic changes, especially in California, but throughout the country, have produced a situation where Chicano studies is now one of the hottest topics across the country. Um, Cornell University, Columbia, uh, lots of major institutions now have Chicano Latino studies. Latino in order to include all of the Spanish-speaking groups now that reside in, in the United States. So um, as you know well, there was a Chicano studies program here at UCSD from 1973 to 1989. Um, it went away for a long time and we decided, and you were on the committee with me, uh, we had almost unanimous support from all our Chicano faculty to establish uh, or to reestablish a Chicano studies program. Now with the Chicano Latino component and focusing specifically on the arts and humanities so that we can cover the incredible cultural production that's being uh, created by our young people. Mm -hmm. What kind of courses then would be offered? What, what, what would the curriculum consist of? Well, our curriculum exists uh, already. It's in place in the various academic departments. What the program will do now is coordinate those course offerings, something that we haven't had here in a long time. And so we'll include from theater and dance uh, specific courses, most of them you, taught by you, on Chicano drama, for example. We'll have our literature courses. We'll have uh, some courses in communication, visual arts on pre-Columbian art, for example. Mm -hmm. History is very important for us because that's the base uh, that we want our students to have. And then we'll also be collaborating with our colleagues in ethnic studies, um, although they tend to focus more on social science issues. Many of them do cultural research, and so uh, their courses will be counted as well. Mm -hmm. For the, the viewers who don't necessarily know the difference between Chicana or Chicano, Latina, Hispanic, what, what do you see as the differences between the various groups that call themselves or Latino or Hispanic? Well, I think, you know, there are two generic terms. One is Hispanic, one is Latino, and, and those are used as umbrella terms to talk about all the Spanish-speaking groups in the United States. And let me emphasize that we are talking about Spanish-speaking groups in the United States. We're not talking about Latin America per se, although Latin American history and culture form the background for mm -hmm. what we're doing. But um, Latino is, and Latina, uh, to make it uh, inclusive of the women, is, I think, the most accepted term now as an umbrella term. Hispanic was created both by the federal government and marketers and there are many of us uh, in the community who feel that, that that has a kind of meaning that doesn't capture the full historical reality of our community. So Latino, again, is a generic term. And then as you break them down, we have all the various groups. Mm -hmm. Chicano specifically comes, as you know, from the Mexican-American experience. Uh, it came into popularity in the late 1960s when young people took it on as a positive term. It had been a negative term in our communities. Um, and so it, it still tends to mean a Mexican-American with attitude, if you will, <laughs> uh, a Mexican-American who uh, asserts his or her um, opportunities, his or her right to full citizenship. And so it's, it's a politicized term, really, and we've kept it. We think that's important. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I heard uh, a few years back that the only people who called themselves Chicanas and Chicanos were gray-haired academics. No, I, that's <laughs> not my experience, although that, that's true of us, I suppose. <laughs> Um, what we find with our young undergraduates is that many of them are very attracted to the term still because of what it implies. It's true that in the late 60s and early 70s there was a full-blown social movement, the Chicano movement, um, that created Chicano Studies programs. And um, so those of us who were young at that time uh, draw on that history, but I think None of us are stuck in the 60s, if you will. I think a, a lot of us now understand that the demographic changes, that the changes in attitudes of our young people necessitate a, an updating, if you will, or an upgrading of the, the concept of Chicano studies. And that's what this program is trying to do. So you still haven't told me, but I'll tell you what I mm. see is the differences between the Chicana, Chicano, the Puerto Rican, the second largest uh, Latino group in the country, mainland Puerto Ricans, third being the Cubans, and then all of the other groups. Uh, first of all, it's important to know that the Chicanas and the Chicanos are the good-looking ones. This is what I tell my students, and they, they don't argue. I'm joking, of course. The Chicana Chicano is the largest, as you know, the largest group uh, within our country, and it's in, in numbers in the millions. And then the Puerto Ricans, and then, of course, the Cubans, and they're very distinct, you know, they're very mm -hmm. distinct groups. How many courses will we have that might, in fact, address those differences or, or be pan-Latino, if you will? Mm -hmm. Well, at the moment, our faculty is fairly limited. Um, historically, UCSD has never had a large group of Chicano Latino faculty, although it was larger in the late 70s than it is today. So that tells you something about the needs of the campus. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, we'll have a handful of courses that are not focused on Mexican American issues. We have some excellent new faculty coming on board in communications. We have one woman who works on Salvadoran issues. There's a large Salvadoran American community now, mm -hmm. especially in Los Angeles. Um, we have Ana Celia Centella in Ethnic Studies, mm -hmm. who does pan-Latino research uh, focusing on Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, and other groups on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we're, we're still s hoping, really, to hire more faculty in those areas so that we can expand our offerings. Yeah, I teach uh, at least two different courses that look at the, the varieties. I think that one thing is missing when we describe ourselves as either Hispanic or Latino, and that's the Afro. You know, the true, I think the true definition of our community would be Afro-Indo-Hispano, you know, mm -hmm. meaning we're African and Native American and Hispanic or Spanish, and yet also a lot of our people uh, from Mexican and all the way down to, to South America have German uh, mix or, or you name it, you know, French, Italian, etc. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, I think racial categories that don't capture the full reality of our history and our communities. And I, I had been referring to Spanish speaking groups, but of course, they're all the indigenous language speaking mm -hmm. groups in our, uh, in our history. And many of them are up here working in North County and, and mm -hmm. all through the country now. And so eventually, we'd like to cover those groups and have more courses on indigenous cultures. Um, one of our faculty members in visual arts right now is offering courses on pre-Columbian art. So that's very important for our students to get. Why? Why do you think it's important for the Latina, Latino students to know about the pre-Columbian cultures and societies? And well, I think as, as part of the Americas, uh, and th this is the term I like, I, I actually like the term Americano in Spanish because that captures not only the North American reality but the southern mm -hmm. uh, part of the hemisphere and, and that's where most of our people came from mm -hmm. um, beginning very early on in the 15th and 16th centuries. So uh, our, our ties with the indigenous groups go that far back and as a mestizo culture, a mixed culture, I think it's important for students to know that long history extending way back before the United States came into being and certainly before 1848 when the United States came to the Southwest and, and took mm -hmm. the land. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the minor, because we're talking about a new minor and it's open to any of the students at UCSD, um, would be important in all disciplines or do you think it's only because it is arts and humanities or is it specific to people wanting to go into only certain fields? Well, our hope is that uh, all students will be interested mm -hmm. in it. Um, as you know, uh, again, given the demographic reality, people who are pre-med, people who are engineers, uh, people who want to be attorneys, say, uh, will gain a great deal by learning the Spanish language. And our new minor does have a, a language requirement. Mm. It's not that rigorous, but it gives them a foundation in the language. 
and uh, for them to learn about the history and culture of these groups will be a benefit, it seems to us, when they get into the job market and employers ask them, um, what do you know about the largest group now mm -hmm. in the United States in terms of minority status, what we used to call minority, although in California we'll, we'll be the majority soon enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very, very crucial. Uh, the, uh, the students that I write letters for, even to medical school, to law school, to whatever, and they've taken my Chicano theater courses, I'm you know, very happy to report that this student was interested in these cultures and, you know, and, and did well. Uh, in knowing, who, or at least beginning to know, who we are. But you're right, we're all over the place. Whenever I travel oh, anywhere in this country, you're going to find Latinos. It's, I call it the salsification <laughs> of the yeah. U.S., right. not just because there's more salsa consumed than ketchup, That's but right. because we are everywhere. Right, and Richard Rodriguez, of course, has just written a book called Brown, when he calls it the browning of America, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is a term I don't particularly like. But mm -hmm. it's true that, um, you know, in places like Arkansas, North Carolina, the number of Latinos has jumped uh, in the decade of the 90s by over 300 percent. So um, Mexican immigrants and Central American immigrants are now all through what we used to call the Deep South, mm -hmm. uh, which is why the Trent Lott uh, affair was very interesting to me because the press continued to talk about that as a black-white reality when in fact the old Confederacy, as, as Trent Lott might like to think of it, is full now of Mexican Americans and well they're Mexicans they're, yeah, they're yeah. recent immigrants their mm -hmm. children will be Chicanos mm -hmm. hopefully mm -hmm. and uh, and other groups so um, and then we haven't really talked about the Cuban reality in Florida which began many many decades ago and then kind of changed its focus in in the 60s but yes I mean the the overall population of the United States is going to change and people need to know about our history and our culture. Yeah, no, it's changed completely. My students, we both teach Chicano-related courses, as I've said, and uh, when I first started teaching here in 1975, the majority of my students in a Chicana, Chicano theater course were Chicanas and Chicanos, mm -hmm. and many were you know, urban or from the fields, Mexican, many, most of them, their parents were born in Mexico, and now, not only are they becoming more middle class, mm -hmm and uh, the children of professionals like you and, and myself, but also mixed, you know. They come from a variety of cultures. They're not just, you know, two Mexican parents that say Mexican and an Armenian like my kids, mm -hmm. or Mexican and Salvadoreño, or Afri Afro African-American and, uh, and Cuban, and, and you name it. Do you see that in your classes Oh, absolutely. Well? The, the mixtures are very interesting now, and, uh, and that's going to continue, I think. Do these courses, do the courses that we're offering by and large, address that um, multivocality of, of these uh, cultures? I think uh, many of our courses will. Um, we have in literature, for example, courses that specifically uh, target uh, comparative analysis of, mm -hmm. say, Puerto Rican and Chicano literature. Uh, my colleague Marta Sanchez, for example, regularly teaches a course like that and uh, has published on Puerto Rican and African American mm -hmm. literature. Mm -hmm. So all of these identities that you're talking about manifest themselves through the arts and that's why we're focusing so heavily on mm -hmm. on the culture because we think that the identities can't be understood outside of the context of the history and the cultural production. So um, yes, I think we will be covering all these new realities. And I, your point about uh, other ethnic groups, if you will, learning about Spanish-speaking groups being important. I think that's very, very key here because this is not a vanity program. This is not just for mm -hmm. students who come from our background. It's for, other, it's for all people. It's for all students. And I might say a lot of our faculty colleagues and administrators should probably take our courses because they need to know who we are and how long we've been here and, and where we're going. Mm -hmm. Do you see this a new program attracting more Latinas and Latinos to our campus? Well, certainly that's one of our hopes. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to increase the numbers at the undergraduate and graduate level. And we feel that if uh, prospective students see that the campus is interested in the culture they come from, mm -hmm. they'll be more inclined to attend UCSD. Um, our campus tends to accept fairly good numbers of Chicano and Latino students, 
but what we call the yield is always very low. So they don't decide to come here finally. Mm -hmm. And our feeling is that one of the reasons, there's a lot of complex reasons, but one of them is that they don't see anything visible on our campus that reflects the community they're coming out of. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're hoping that it'll have a very good effect on recruitment and retention mm -hmm. of students. Yeah, I would hope so. That's certainly one of our goals in, in, in our department. Why do you suppose there was a decline? You know, you were talking about that, that period in the 80s when Chicano Studies was no longer here and, and in a lot of different campuses because this is it's a national movement as you said that right. started in the 60s and then sort of went into a hiatus. Do you, do you have any ideas why? Well I think there's a lot of different reasons depending on specific locale. Um, here for example in the late 80s you and I were part of this movement to create an ethnic studies department on our campus and we were successful in that. Mm -hmm. um, for all kinds of reasons having to do with philosophy and a lack of resources, that department wasn't able to build up the Chicano Studies section uh, as we might have hoped. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're beginning to do that now with some of the people I mentioned. But for that 10 year period from about 89 to 99, mm -hmm. we didn't see much growth. And that stimulated us to propose this other program to complement what they do. And mm -hmm. of course, we'll be working very closely with them. Yeah, with, without the support of the Ethnic Studies Department, this would not have been approved. Right, I think uh, their support was key. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, as you move throughout the country, you find different reasons for the decline in Chicano Studies program. Chicano Studies programs have always been strongest in terms of student numbers at the state college level. Cal State's almost all of them have Chicano Studies programs. They're, they're still flourishing. Um, they have greater numbers. And they have Chicanos greater numbers. And, and they have, absolutely, they have greater student interest and, and more faculty probably than we do. Um, as you know, having taught at Santa Barbara for so long, um, Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara is the only campus with a Chicano Studies department. Mm -hmm. which means they have the ability to hire their own faculty and mm -hmm. they have many more resources. But all the other UC campuses have Chicano Studies programs. Ours is the only one that doesn't have a separate one until now, which is our new program with the minor attached to it. We just have a, a one minute literally left. Um, let's talk a little bit about the visual programs, the, the outreach programs that the, the minor and the program are going to bring to the campus. Right, well, um, you know, uh, Chicano Studies was invented, if you will, in 1969 on the Santa Barbara campus uh, when they wrote something called the Plan de Santa Barbara, when activists and students wrote that plan. Um, and one of the key components there was that the university had to begin to serve the Chicano community. They phrased it as saying that they ha the university has to serve the community in which it's located. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to bring that philosophy into our program. We, we feel very strongly that we need to get out into the community. All the lectures we bring to campus now will also lecture or perform if they're artists down in the community of San Diego in the various Spanish-speaking areas mm -hmm. in the Central Library downtown. So we'll be very visible outside of La Jolla, mm -hmm. and we think that's key. That's important. That's really, really crucial. I think that's been a, a wonderful achievement, and I congratulate you and the rest of us for having this uh, evolve to where we are today. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Coming up later on UCSD Conversations, UCSD Police Chief Orville King and Dr. Jerry Boss on a program that introduces high school students to health careers. But now, move over Super Mario Brothers. At UCSD, computer science students get a taste of what it takes to design computer games for the internet. They're video games you won't play at your local arcade, on your Xbox or PlayStation, or even online. First-person shooter games like Shrapnel and RoboStrike, racing games like Los Cartos Locos, or classic strategy games such as Spellcraft or IO. That's because all five games were designed by computer science seniors at UCSD as their main requirement for one of the hottest courses on campus. It was probably like my biggest time commitment on anything ever, I think. <laughs> Spent, you know, up till two in the morning every day, you know, just 
working on the game. It's a lot of fun. Out of all my courses, this is one that taught me the most, I spent the most time on, was the most difficult, and also the most rewarding. They're in their last quarter of their senior year in college. You know, what they really want to do is graduate and move on. But they're in here for full 10 weeks, working day and night, trying to get these games to work. And in the end, they all succeed. Jeff Volker created the course, a popular professor in the Computer Science and Engineering Department at the Jacobs School of Engineering. He teaches fundamentals of programming. This class on operating systems, for instance, is a prerequisite for Volker's senior level project course held just once a year. Only 30 students are accepted, but two or three times as many apply. The course is called Software System Design and Implementation but it's known better on campus as the video game course. They get to take everything that they've learned as an undergraduate student in our major and apply it to something that they're very excited about, which is building large-scale, multiplayer, network, real-time 3D games. They take all the knowledge they learned about algorithms and operating systems and graphics and networking, and, and in this course, they take it and they apply it. And they don't just apply it to a project that we specify and they have to do. They apply it to something that they're very excited about and very passionate about. The class splits into five teams. Programming in C++, they must write five to 10,000 lines of code for an original online game that must be playable by at least four players simultaneously. Team members report and meet weekly with Volker on their progress, but otherwise are left to their own devices. We essentially give them a blank slate, and they have to fill everything in. And that goes from what you see on the screen, the type of game that you wind up playing, um, the goals of the game, what you see, how you interact, and how everything is implemented underneath the covers. Often projects in other classes are very uh, well specified. Um, you are going to implement this, and here is how you're going to do it. Um, in this course, it's, it's just the opposite. All, all I tell them to do is they have to write a game that is able to support four players and they need to do it in 10 weeks. They're writing thousands and thousands of lines of code at a, at a relatively rapid pace and often things just go wrong and it's really tough to track down why. They run into bugs that aren't, aren't well known and certainly I don't know the answer to, to their problems. And one of the things that they have to do is they have to learn how to solve the problems themselves first identify that it is a problem, figure out what the problem is, and then somehow through news groups, the web, emailing authors of, of code, go out and figure out how to solve this problem on their own. I can give them encouragement, I can give them leads, but I can't give them the answer. Volker tries to balance out backgrounds and personal interests, breaking each six-person project into teams. Students who work together um, are able to look over each other's shoulder and catch mistakes that they make catch bugs early on and fix them, and more than one person has an understanding of how that part of the game actually works. Each member specializes in one of three areas, graphics, underlying software, or networking. There's the graphics part that everybody sees, but behind the graphics part there's a simulation environment to simulate the game. Um, since it's multiplayer and network, there's a networking component. The game itself is, is relatively complex. It's, it's multi-threaded, so um, all the threading that they learn and concurrency and synchronization that they learn in their operating systems course, they're going to apply here just to be able to handle multiple players running at the same time. It's a very large software project, and software projects are complex. And managing that complexity takes a bit of, of both technical talent as well as creativity in, in managing that kind of software. After graduation, most computer science students end up working on large, complex projects that require teamwork and organizational skills. Volker says the video game course is a dry run for the real world. The skills that they learned in this course are applicable not only to going into a games company and working for games, but any sort of software engineering position that they might go into. Uh, one of the explicit goals of the course is to to have students work on a project that is unlike any of the other projects they've worked on in any of their other classes. It's something that, that they will be doing all the time when they go off into industry or the, the next stage of their career, whether it is uh, programming at a company or it's in graduate school working on research. These are students that, that you know, I'd love to work with in graduate school that companies would love to, to hire.
While the course gives students a good sense of what it takes to design a game from scratch, Volker insists that it's a lot more than fun and games. For the most part, students see it as a fun project. Uh, a lot of students who go into computer science, they, they've grown up playing games, they like to play games. This is a hobby that they, that they have had, that they'll continue to have. Um, but but uh, only a few students out of the course are really interested in going into the games industry as a profession. For those who want a career in game design, Volker gets top industry executives to come in and give students an insider's look at how it works. In 2002, executives from two San Diego-based companies, Sony Online Entertainment and Angel Studios, talked to the class. Sony Online Manager of Technology, Matt Sievertson, who got his bachelor's degree in computer science from UCSD in 1999, researches new technology for the company best known for EverQuest, its massively multiplayer online game. Well, when I spoke to the class, uh, I mainly focused on how making a massive multiplayer game, which is what we focus on is, in this company, is different from um, a, a standard either multiplayer or single player game. They were all very enthusiastic about it, um, and there was uh, no shortage of questions. We actually ran out of time. Sievertson is now working on the next generation of EverQuest, as well as an upcoming online game called Star Wars Galaxies. And after seeing Volker's students make their presentations last June, he hired two of them. Sievertson says he appreciates that they came in knowing the basics of how to create a video game and with a major project to show for it. To me, the biggest thing is that that class is a lot of work. It takes a lot of time out of their day. And uh, you know that they really like video games if they, if they completed that course. And that's you know, something that we want here. We want people who are enthusiastic about the gaming industry. One of the new recruits to Sony Online is Andy Skirvin. He now designs games for third generation cell phones, even while he works on a master's degree at UCSD. It's the, like, the one class at UCSD that I took in computer science to actually approximate like real world environment. Um, you have a team of six people and everyone has their roles. It's a very self-motivated class. The professor doesn't, um, you know, he doesn't make you do the work. It's the class that kind of makes you do the work. As a senior, Skirvin worked with five other students on the racing game Los Cardos Locos. This is a multiplayer kart racing game, and the idea is to go around, go around the lap and win the race. The students uh, for the Los Cardos Locos game uh, indulged very creatively. Um, they have lots of billboards that have lots of funny signs and jokes, and they have lots of funny sound bites that happen that they play when you you know, you hit an oil slick or something like that. Sumit Singh and Chris Rosner worked with Andy on the racing game. You know, I had never really worked on components like sound or graphics because you usually don't get to, especially in a class projects. So that was something uh, new which I was going to be doing. This class has taught me a lot about, you know, what it, what it involves to be on a big team project, you know, how much actual work is involved and, uh, you know, what sort of, what sort of uh, skill set you need to uh, succeed in making games. Among other games produced by Volker's most recent class, Spellcraft and IO are strategy games, although IO is turn-based while Spellcraft has everyone moving at the same time. And there were two so-called first-person shooter games. In Shrapnel, you're in a, you know, a souped-up spacesuit inside of a rotating spacecraft orbiting around a planet, and you're in teams going around uh, trying to, you know, hunt down the enemy and eliminate the enemy before they eliminate you. Panayoti Haritatos and Tim Foley worked on Shrapnel. I'm a game player. That's what, what I like to do in my free time. And uh, the chance to make games, obviously, I'm, I, I think I have some, somewhat of a creative nature. So the chance to actually be involved in making a, a game is something I've always wanted to uh, be able to do. When you're enjoying what you're working on, it, it doesn't matter how much work it takes. You're going to do what you can to make it be the best end product you can come up with. RoboStrike is, is another classic sort of first-person shooter. It just so happens that they made the, the, the context of the game be the UCSD campus. So in the game, they have a very nice model of the, the library, for example. And um, you just go around. There are mutant robots that have gone out. And uh, you have to take care of, of taking shooting down the, the mutant robots. The course wet many students' appetites for more. Of the five students interviewed for this story, one is already working in the video game industry, and three others hope to follow suit now or after grad school. Everybody tells you that game programming is the most demanding, you know, worst paying programming job you can find, and it really takes dedication. And so I kind of took this course to find out whether or not I had that kind of dedication. Does he? Definitely.
the students did great. Um, they, they not only met, met my expectations, but they far exceeded them. It's just amazing to see what, what they're able to do in just 10 weeks. This is the reason why we have the curriculum that we have in the computer science department, is if, if you go through the curriculum, then by the end, you have the skills and the talent to be able to do a kind of course like this. Honestly, you know, if I'm looking for a, a new hire right out of college, the first place I would go is to um, see who's coming out of that class and, and see what they've done there. Because uh, that's, you know, they're going to know what needs to be done and they're going to be have a step ahead of everybody else. Coming up later on Conversations, Dr. Jerry Boss on a program that introduces students to careers in healthcare. But now, we'll see what it takes to keep a university campus safe with UCSD's new Chief of Police, Orville King. Negative, CW. 60814. Sir, you know what? I changed my mind. I'm just going to give you a simple warning. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to believe that you are going to get I'm this gonna fixed. Get it fixed. It's important. <laughs> It is important, yeah. okay? So instead of giving you a fix-it ticket, where even the process itself is very, very simple, okay. I'm gonna make it more simple for you. Thank you, that's very nice. Okay, so the traffic... I believe there's basically two types of people here. The type that are trying to get somewhere, which would be the students and, and their future, and there's those of us who are trying to help them get there, whether it be faculty or staff or whomever. No, fifth year senior. Fifth year senior? I was a six and a half years ago. <laughs> the role of the chief is to, as we say, protect and serve, provide the, the tools for our officers and the individuals that work in the department to function as a team. We have 27 police officers, uh, and the vast majority of those officers work in patrol out in the field, uh, handling crime reports, handling community contacts daily in uniform. Typically we could have three to five officers, patrol officers on duty at a given time, and they begin their shift through a patrol briefing, which again is very similar to briefings that are conducted by all law enforcement agencies. Mac and um, Scott ended up getting into a fight in Tioga with this, with this guy. He's, uh, they know who he is. Uh, transient and uh, went and notified warrant on him. And the briefing gives the individual officers an opportunity to get updated exactly what is going on on campus so that when they go to their patrol car and get inside they have information to help them start the day. King Baker Green to cover 4459 alarm, TDK business 6165 Greenwich. 611-108-B2 vehicle 0517. First thing I do when I start my day after checking out my vehicle, I go and patrol my entire beat, see what's going on, see if uh, what vehicles are, are parked, um, and just look at the level of activity starting off the day. Every day is a little different. Each situation has uh, maybe the same, but there's always a little twist and turns to it. it makes it interesting. So I got a vehicle here and shouldn't be here. Uh, let me find out what's turn around and find out what's going on. How you doing? Oh good. Are oh, you doing a traffic survey? Yes, this is okay. okay. I talked to him. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Alright. Thank you. Okay. Six Eleven Cold Forts. The woman doing the traffic survey. Our officers are fully sworn police officers through the state of California, through the peace officers' standards and training. So all of the authority that's typically extended to a municipal police officer is extended to the university police officer on this campus. When the time comes that the violation requires them to go to jail, and they do go to jail, it's a wake-up call. 
we are a police department. We are going to enforce laws. If someone needs to go to jail, they'll go to jail. And then they realize, oh, wow, I had no idea. You are real police. When individuals are arrested on campus, they're brought directly here to the facility for us to be able to uh, detain temporarily individuals before we actually take them to central jail, uh, which is where suspects we arrest, that's where they go here in San Diego. We also have our own dispatchers who are fully trained as they are in every police department. We are a public service answering point and that means that all 911 calls that originate on this campus come to our dispatch area. Uh, we answer every call. UCSD Police, this is Ron. We hire dispatchers for their ability to make decisions, quick and effective decisions, so dispatchers here get paid for what they know, not really what they do, because we can have a lot of downtime and then out of the blue we can get a call of a, a hot call, a robbery or violent um, assaults and things like that. The dispatchers go through about three months of training. We have to learn uh, the California Penal Code and then all the other different uh, computer programs and databases that we access, which are, are a lot. Yeah. If you sat down and, and picked up a phone and were trying to get information from someone, you probably wouldn't get all the details. Dispatchers are trained to get the details. Police Department, do you need assistance? We also have a number of community service officers that are students on campus that work part-time and providing escorts and uh, non-enforcement related services to the university and to the police department. Hi guys, how are we doing? You think I could get you guys to move your cars out of the turnaround here, kind of block an emergency access? Can you do me a favor, I'd appreciate that. We start at 5 p.m. and we go till 1.30 in the morning. Um, as a typical escort shift, like tonight's escort shift is going to go from 5 to 1.30. Um, if stuff happens, like they need to hold us over because there's a whole bunch of escorts or because there's uh, an emergency on campus they want our help with, then we'll, um, you know, we'll stay a little bit later because everybody at the police department is pretty much a team. So we try and fit in there as much as we possibly can um, to help out as much as we can. If you guys want to stay 10-10 and make sure that people move their cars. We started a new training program this year. It ranges from things such as a bike check to make sure you know your air brake cranks, your gear is all set to go, to things like uh, medical emergencies. What do you do once you get on scene? We go through a full day of first aid training, CPR training, defibrillator training. Stand back. You're clear. I'm clear. Everybody's clear. Clear. Stand clear. Push analyze. They go through about five to six weeks of training. Um, and then if we feel they're ready, then we cut them off for probation or training and um, then they become CSOs. And then after that, it's a lot, of, a lot more on the job training. You know, I'm, I've been here since my fourth year and you still end up learning different things on shift. But I have no problem with newbie pairs covering vet pairs because there's only going to be two vets on tonight uh, plus me and I might be tied up. We have 10 residential security officers that are working in the residential areas to provide what I would call pre enforcement security. Our primary function is the safety and the security of all the students, specifically the ones living on campus, but also just students in general. And the primary focus is the housing areas and the adjacent uh, connecting areas to the housing buildings. Sort of the eyes and ears at nighttime to uh, ensure their safety, make sure their suite doors are locked. Also, another deal is to make sure that we enforce the policies, which sometimes the students don't like us for that, but part of the job. Guys, just remember you can't prop your suite. The suite door can't be propped, left propped open. Okay, just so you remember, because it's, it's a fire door, so it's a fire code violation. All right, thanks guys. The alcohol poisonings, that's a real serious concern, and it's one of the things that I have a hard time uh, on a personal level dealing with is to see these students uh, drink themselves to a point to where uh, they're basically unconscious from alcohol and the students are just afraid to tell us sometimes when their friends coming back from TJ or from an off-campus party that they need to go to the hospital because they're afraid their friends gonna get in trouble and it's one of the hardest things we deal with here I think on trying to get get it across the students it's like yeah they may get in trouble because of the alcohol, 
but it's not worth them dying over. We've had a few over the last two or three years that have been real bad, that have been real close, that if we hadn't intervened, they may not have made it. We also have an active senior volunteer program on campus. The senior volunteers play a critical role in theft prevention, and most importantly, they're ambassadors to the community. What we do when we go on the field, we go through the buildings and we try to warn uh, staff and students about the possibility of getting their things stolen. And primarily, we look at three things. Number one is wallets and purses. Number two would be computers, uh, particularly laptops. And the third thing would be backpacks. Now here might be an area that we would, we would look into. You know, just take a quick look, see if we see anything like, you know, purses, wallets, laptop, or no, nobody here. There is someone back here. We want to be careful not to intrude into people's spaces. We don't want them to feel like we're, you know, intruding on their privacy. And, but then again, if we see an, an open door like that and we don't see anyone in, we'll step in. Criminal activity on the campus remains relatively constant. It has over the past few years. We don't really anticipate any increase in crime, and partly that's handled because we have the personnel to do the job. Uh, if we add field personnel over the next few years, I would expect we'll be able to see the same kinds of results that we're getting now. What provides satisfaction to me, and I believe that carries through the organization, is knowing that at the end of the day, our officers, our dispatchers, our support personnel have made a difference. That, as I said earlier, our job is to help people get where they want to go. And if we've done that, then I think we've done the job we were asked to do. Two and three, thank you very much. Finally tonight, Dr. Jerry Boss discusses the Science Education Partnership Awards Program with UCSD-TV's Eric von Neumann. Professor Boss, can you give us the background on the SEPA program? SEPA stands for Science Education Partnership Award, SEPA. Uh, it was initiated by the National Institutes of Health as a way to increase the number of underrepresented minority students who enter health-related careers. We have specifically formed a partnership between a medical school and, in our case, uh, Helix High School in La Mesa and Morse High School in Southeast San Diego. Our partnership is at the uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade levels of students. In the 10th grade, we have faculty from the School of Medicine going to the schools and providing lectures on an, an assortment of health-related topics. Um, in the 11th grade, we have students uh, pick one of the topic areas that um, they've had lectures on, and they are expected to go in depth and study about that, um, mostly through online learning. Then in the 12th grade, uh, what we do is the students now take what they have learned and they disseminate that, they teach that to younger students in the fifth through eighth grade uh, level. So we sort of have a built-in peer teaching model as part of this. They've all chosen an individual topic that they wanted to research. The topics all have something to do with health. They're usually uh, topics that are of interest to adolescents and they have attempted to find out something about how to educate their peers or kids that are younger than them in some of these health topics that they are interested in. My topic is tattoos and body piercings and basically it's going off like the harmful effects and it's basically like an overview of what people should think about before they get tattoos or piercings. It talks about hepatitis and tetanus and keloids and how to clean them and how to take care of them and all the other necessities before you get an actual tattoo or body piercing. The project I'm working on right now is just basically um, I go to Le Mans classes and I have a pre-survey, a pamphlet, and a post-survey and it's basically just to figure out if 
parent, expectant parents know about learning disabilities, if they feel that there's a need to learn about learning disabilities, if they think they might have one, etc. It's just to figure out what they need to have if they're if they find out their children do have learning disabilities because learning disabilities are very hard to identify especially at a very young age. You usually don't figure out that a person has a learning disability until about third or fourth grade when they start learning how to develop sentences, express thoughts through writing and spelling, anything like that. My project is basically, it deals with ocean health and uh, what I started out kind of broadly. I didn't realize how broad I'd started out until I had to actually get down to doing the work. But um, what it's come down to is basically um, whether or not certain bacteria, such as um, coliform and enterococcus, I believe you pronounce it, whether or not it's risen in, la in recent years in our local beaches. And so I basically used um, the survey that the San Diego Department of Environmental Health uh, created about three years ago and their results and I took that and um, I basically created teaching tools to teach uh, middle schoolers about how to protect themselves, what the dangers are that are out there when they go to the beach and how to make sure that they don't get sick themselves. These kids, these 12th graders have gone in and they've chosen various topics and they've talked to 7th, 8th graders, 6th graders about those issues and been able to answer questions. That's normally called service learning. And it's kind of like the student health advocates that are coming to this level. These kids are going to a little bit lower level in the hopes that those kids will listen to them. And hopefully they'll listen to them better than they would listen to an adult. And on some of these topics, they will. And that's the whole idea. Can we get through to these kids in a different way so as to make a difference? And we think that if we use the power of students, to educate other students, then it'll get through. What uh, types of health care issues are you bringing to the school? Okay. That, that, that first contact with the, uh, the faculty in the, at the 10th grade level. We have four separate units, as we call them. The first one is biopsychology, in which various topics are addressed as, for example, um, drugs, um, stress uh, in, uh, in the teenager's life. Um, actually, we even get into things like domestic uh, violence, um, um, topics that the students uh, can relate to, actually topics that the students asked us to discuss. The uh, second unit uh, is called cancer genetics and we talk about various kinds of cancers, again, those that the students are interested in and those that we relate to their curriculum. Uh, for example, um, if the students are talking about environmental health exposures, particulates uh, in the air, then we will have one of the faculty come and talk about lung cancer as an example. Um, a, the third unit is infectious diseases and um, there we talk about the diseases that the students are particularly interested in. For example, herpes would obviously be one that they are very concerned about, uh, HIV as another, uh, and we have an infectious disease specialist who talks to them about that. And the fourth unit is broadly termed adolescent health in, in general, health issues that the students are, are concerned about that don't necessarily fall into one of the other uh, categories. Um, just sort of basic kinds of health-related uh, matters um, that they are interested in. We let them guide our talks and our discussions. <laughs> Throughout all three grades, the students have field trips that they come to the UCSD Medical Center as well as coming up here to the UCSD campus. Um, the field trips to the medical center um, include visits to various parts of the uh, hospital, uh, as well as actually sometimes going on rounds with individual physicians at the uh, medical center. What we're looking at now is, that's the tumor right there. These fatty tumors are not uh, real vascular, which means they don't have a real big blood supply. And as long as it's not bleeding badly, we'll just keep pulling it up in pieces. The field trips here to the uh, UCSD campus 
uh, are coming to laboratories to see what basic science uh, is about, how science is performed, as well as to medical student teaching laboratories where they actually get to see and handle um, various organs, brains, hearts, etc. from uh, patients. It seems that the SEPA program has a two-pronged mission. Uh, when you're in the high school, you're doing preventive health care seminars. And then there's also the promotion of, of uh, possible health care careers for these students later. We feel the, the two together um, are, are very closely related, and although you could certainly uh, call them uh, two-prong, um, the idea is by getting the students interested in health-related issues, ones again that they ask for, then they will become more interested in a health-related uh, career. Uh, so the two are sort of go hand in hand as, as we look at it. I understand that you have very realistic ideas about how much you can promote a healthcare career to these students. Um, you're not trying to make them all brain surgeons no. uh, necessarily, um, but what's, what's sort of the philosophy behind the exposure to careers in the health field? When we take them on the field trips to the medical center, um, we take them uh, on tours of various parts of the uh, hospital, uh, including the uh, cast room where they see uh, people working there, the technicians on putting cast on patients, and they do much, much more than that. Um, we take them to the laboratories where they see all the support personnel that are required uh, to take care of uh, patients. Uh, we take them uh, to the pharmacy, we take them to radiology, we take them all over the hospital so they see that a hospital is much, much more than doctors and nurses. Um, clearly, um, we would be very pleased if these, some of these students chose careers as either physicians or, or nurses, but there is so much more uh, that goes into making up a hospital and so um, we will also feel that we have been successful if the students choose careers such as an orthopedic uh, technician or a radiology uh, technician um, because those in those fields there's also a, a disproportionately low number of underrepresented uh, minorities so any way we can sort of have people become interested in health related careers I think would be all to the uh, to the advantage. It, it's too early to tell yet whether or not we've been successful um, but based on questionnaires that we give to the students it certainly seems like we have been uh, and one of the things very simply that we do before they enter the program we ask the students to list as many health related careers as they possibly can and not surprisingly, doctors, nurses, dentists, etc., cetera, are, are on that list. Um, but after that, the list um, really does kind of uh, peter out. But after they've been on their tours, the list is much, much longer, uh, and it shows that they are now well aware that there <clears throat> are a large number of health-related careers uh, in which they could potentially uh, enter uh, and um, have a fulfilling career. I kind of came in in the very beginning as like, oh, I don't like science at all or anything like that. And I wasn't interested in um, being a doctor or medicine. Like, and I came into this year and I did my own research and I found out like there's a lot more fields out there than I had originally thought. I mean, I knew there were more out there than just doctors and nurses, but um, I've kind of become more interested in just science and stuff like that. I, I don't think I'll be a doctor, but I have gained a more awareness about the whole issues. One of the other field trips we went on was to the public health lab and the speaker there was pretty interesting. She got me thinking about epidemiology, which is I guess more of a social aspect of it, of um, learning about infectious diseases and how they go through the population and stuff like that, and that sounded like a lot of fun. So I've been leaning towards that. What else did the students do after the field trip? After field trips, they're expected to write reports um, and to tell sort of what they liked about it and what they didn't like. And then that serves as another purpose that it allows us to improve the program and find out which parts of the field trip are particularly successful and which ones we need to try to improve on. What we're also having them do this year is, is to create pamphlets in which we expect them to make um, some kind of little flyers, brochures actually if you will, that can be distributed to lower grade students that will 
be catchy um, and will draw the attention of the younger students so that they will now hopefully be interested in reading about this health-related topic, whatever it, it might be. Um, we actually have um, uh, quite sophisticated equipment at the school that we were able to purchase uh, with the funds um, from the SEPA grant and therefore the students can actually do uh, publication quality uh, work. And this program has been going on for a number of years now. Yes, we, we are now in our um, fifth uh, year, beginning of our fifth, early on in our fifth year. Are there many specific uh, students that have been um, uh, a surprisingly uh, successful uh, response to the program? Yes, yes there have been actually. Uh, quite a few actually that come to mind that have, when we started out, um, we were a little bit concerned about the student, thinking that uh, they weren't interested at all, but they've turned out to be some of the more enthusiastic ones. Um, uh, several of them now are in uh, college, and we're going to track their careers and follow them and see um, exactly what they do choose in terms of their ultimate uh, profession, uh, vocation, whatever they do. So that is built into the part of the program to track them even after the pro uh, the SEPA award, the funding is over, we will continue to track the uh, students as best as we can. Obviously, there will be some attrition because some of the students won't respond to questionnaires or we will lose their addresses, but to our best possibility, we will certainly follow them as long as we can. Helix High School is a charter school. Correct. Do you think something like the SEPA program would work well in normal public schools? It can certainly be done uh, in a non-charter school, as I said, it, we were doing it at Morse. And other of these 55 SEPA programs certainly do uh, use um, non-charter uh, schools. They are different programs, mind you, but nevertheless, I don't think this requires a, a, a charter school. There are some advantages of charter schools, however, they are more flexible, they, they can be more responsive to changes, but I think the same thing could be done with non-charter schools as well. Since the SEPA program is about to expire, uh, what would you hope to see in the future? The way the funding works is um, it's a total of six years, and so we, as I say, are in the beginning of our fifth, so we have another year and a half or so of funding on the SEPA program. Um, as I mentioned, we want to follow the students and hope that we can see some uh, success here. Um, and we are considering uh, alternative ways to continue um, a similar program. It may have to scale it down somewhat, although uh, a good part of the uh, funding was spent on equipment and that will still uh, be there. Um, and uh, But some of it certainly is personnel operating cost as well. And there are other potential funding mechanisms to uh, obtain. For example, if we really can prove over the next couple of years that we have been uh, successful, then I think other both private as well as public agencies might be very interested in continuing to provide funds um, because if the program has been successful then that certainly is usually the thing that uh, will um, uh, allow people to want to continue to support it. That's great. I want to wish you the best of luck in the future. I know you have another year left and uh, I hope you can keep the, the, the effort going. Okay. Thank you.